Welcome back, everybody. You are watching The Now Morning Show right here on TTT. As we continue to see an increase in the number of positive COVID-19 cases, we check in with Dr. Wheeler to discuss what's taking place. Welcome, Dr. Wheeler. Good morning. And of course, Dr. Wheeler is the PAHO and WHO representative for Trinidad and Tobago and the Dutch Kingdom Islands. Good morning, Good morning. Dr. Wheeler, again, and welcome. Good morning, Carrie. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being here, as usual, to enlighten us and to give us the uh, information that is coming fresh off the press from the WHO and PAHO. Uh, so what does this steady rise in cases mean for us here in Trinidad and Tobago? Okay, so really at this point, we have to be extremely vigilant. Um, there is something called the reproductive number. I think I talked about it quite some time ago mm -hmm. on this same show. And it means for every person, for every individual who is been infected with COVID-19, how many more people they infect. And the average, uh, the average we got from Wuhan at the very beginning was around two. It settled at around 2.6, although it does vary depending on the extent of the spread. When you do have community spread, which we don't yet have in Trinidad and Tobago, but it means that for every one person who has COVID-19, there is the potential to infect two or three people. Mm -hmm. um, so what we are looking at now is the fact that we have certainly two clusters. We may have more, but we know we have two clusters. So it means that that one individual um, was able to spread it, for example, to their family. So this is where you get the increase in numbers. And then when they meet other people, if they go out and about and they don't know they have it, if they're in contact with other individuals for 15 minutes or more, if there is contact um, and that those individuals then touch their eyes, nose, or mouth, they can pick it up. Um, if they sneeze or cough, of course, their droplets can drop onto surfaces and people can touch those surfaces and get it. So it means once your um, reproductive number is two or three, and I believe the government showed a diagram like that, that you can have a significant increase in cases. This is where we are now. We are observing that we are getting more cases every day. <clears throat> so we have to be very vigilant with our public health measures because seriously, if we keep our distance, if we wash our hands and we complement it by wearing masks, then there will not be that spread. If people, when they are ill, do not, and they have flu-like symptoms, do not go to work. If children who are ill do not go to school, there is no way we can have a consistent spread of COVID-19. But Doc this is where we are now. Dr. Wheeler, you've been saying this, the Ministry of Health has been saying it. We've been repeating it over and over and over again, you know, sanitize, wear masks, yes. wash your hands, stay away from people. We've been saying it over and over. And we're still seeing the rise in cases. We still see a lot of people not adhering to the health and safety requirements. Do you think at this point we need to start implementing some sort of penalty? Well, you know, that's not something I can say as PAHO and WHO, but what I can tell you are two things. Every single week, um, WHO has reports from countries all around the world um, what they're doing. And I know that there are countries who are already imposing fines. Let, let me give you an example I can read for you here. New Zealand, if you refuse to take a COVID-19 test, you could be fined $2,600 and held for 28 days. The UK, you could be prosecuted. Um, if you arrive in the UK and you break the quarantine, but actually no one has been fined up to July, nobody has been prosecuted. In Saudi Arabia, if you break the quarantine, you could be um, fined over $3,300 and so on. In South Korea, Spain, Taiwan, um, you know there was a very big outbreak in, in Victoria, in Australia, right. and they have been imposing fines. But it is really a decision of the country based on several things. Certainly, the epidemiological status of uh, the disease, whether it is rising, falling, steady, 
um, how well people are complying. Because remember, if you impose fines or any other punishment, so to speak, um, your community has to be in agreement with it because people, if they don't agree, they will rebel. So it is a matter of continuing to engage your community, but the government will have at some point in time, if there's a continued rise, to take steps in order to protect the public in general. This is why we have immunization as a public good, because some people don't agree to take a vaccine, but if you don't take, if 95%, if, um, for example, of the population is not immunized for certain uh, vaccines, it means others can get it. So it's a similar thing. The government has to take a decision based on where we are and how well it is going to be accepted by the community. But that, that is a decision of a sovereign state. But we can say and report that other countries have, in fact, regulations, laws, and fines. Dr. Wheeler, uh, overnight we saw 12 more cases confirmed. Um, yes. Is there any idea of where these 12 cases would have come from? Would, it, would they have been primary contacts of one of the uh, other proven cases? Well, I don't. I can't tell you about the the twelve cases overnight. I will have to get some more information today. But usually, what happens is this: if it's and it's very very possible because remember we now have clusters. If you have a cluster, which means um, the family members, so we could be talking about adults and children. So children who may have gone to school, as in in the case of the forty three year old man. Um, you have adults who are out and about in the community who, and you would have primary, secondary, and even tertiary contacts. Remember, we talked about contact tracing. Right. Um, so if you're a contact um, and the, the Ministry of Health will have to contact that, that individual who has been diagnosed, sorry, will have to give information on who are all the people they met two days before they showed symptoms and up to 14 days. So it, it means that it's very easy that of these new cases, they could be linked to either of the two clusters. But we have seen also sporadic cases, which means like, for example, in the children's home and the fireman, but they could have been just um, you know, linked to the, the original uh, two clusters. And that's how it spreads. Because if you can infect up to two or three people and you have a cluster, say, of six people with it, you can understand how it can spread. So um, I will have to get some more information on the cases today, but we see the numbers three, four, seven, nine, ten. Mm -hmm. Yesterday was ten and today it's twelve, which right. means we are still increasing. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, uh, hopefully that number doesn't multiply. Um, let's go back in time a little bit, Dr. Wheeler. In uh, 1918, with the influenza pandemic, um, you know, one of the practices that I've read and, and done some research on is the social distancing. You know, um, how important is it today, you know, considering this, this method, well, has been tried and true because we no longer have an influenza pandemic around the world. Influenza still exists, of course, but we no longer have a pandemic. Um, in this day and age, what, what, what more can we do? What more can we do in this day and age? Taking lessons from the past. Well, yes, certainly. What, <clears throat> what was then called, what we now call shelter in place is, in addition to the physical distancing. Because let's think very practically about it. If you never get close enough to someone who has COVID nineteen, how can you get it? Amen. Which is why the evidence about airborne transmission does not. Um, you know, it is not valid as far as we know, unlike TB. TB is an airborne disease. Right. Uh, th but we haven't got any proof except in laboratory settings that COVID-19 is. So what can we do? We, we, we have, um, in cases where we see increasing numbers, we may have to go back into your shelter in place, depending on how serious it becomes certainly the physical distancing but i mean hey if you're at home you're not going to infect anyone right. and if you can't observe um the the distancing and the hand washing there then you know there are those measures of sheltering in place we have to go back to that until 
and if we have a vaccine. And please remember, even if we have a vaccine, we don't know yet how long it will confer immunity. We don't know if it will be three months, a year, two years. We have no idea. So we will still have to implement public health measures. And we don't want to go into a situation where every single person is locked down again. And, and this is the other thing that's happening that I must mention is, of course, these behaviors are happening all over the world, not just in Trinidad, where people do not observe, um, you know, the hygiene and the distancing and, and sending kids to school and going to work. Right. So WHO has set up um, a technical working group. It's called the Behavioral Insights and Sciences Technical Working Group. And it's comprised of 22 persons from countries all over the world, from 16 countries. All, and they are going to be looking into the behavioral aspects and what um, guidance they can give to countries about how do we persuade and how do we engage and how do we get persons to change their behavior. Because it is human behavior that is driving this disease, this unwillingness, and in some cases, inability to um, not physically distance, but we know that is in probably certain places where there's overcrowding in the household and they're not wearing masks and they're not practicing hygiene. But in general, it is our behavior that is driving it, things that we are doing. So this technical working group is going to be making recommendations because we have to combine the public health measures with engaging our community. We need to be getting out more. I, I, it's true, we, we are doing it all the time, but maybe we need to target audiences, young people, children, older people um, better, more, um, in order to get this critical message over. The director general says that the, we have to think about the choices we make, the decisions we make about where we go and what we do, because in some instances, it could be a matter of life and death to you or your family or even a stranger. And he said this quite clearly. All right, Dr. Wheeler, thank you very much for joining us this morning and for sharing, again, always the very important information that we need to continue this battle against COVID-19. So thank you very much, Dr. Wheeler.